My name is Drew Greenblatt. I am so optimistic. I am so bullish about the future, the future of America, the future about American manufacturing. And I attribute this optimism and this enthusiasm because of robotics and automation. It's going to be propelling wonderful things for our nation and for um, our industry, manufacturing, and for my company in particular. So today we're going to be talking about how am I justifying this optimism? How, how can we uh, glean that from all the things you read in the newspapers about, you know, drama with tariffs and the inverted yield curve and that's predicting a recession and all kinds of headwinds we're receiving. What what is the reason for this optimism? What is this enthusiasm, this excitement? We're going to be talking about this today. This is a, a, a picture of uh, two of my wonderful teammates, uh, Malcolm and Eddie, and uh, they work one of our robots, and we're going to be talking more about that today. But we have embraced, Marlin and American Manufacturing in general, have embraced manufacturing automation and robotics, and that's helped propel our success and helped us prosper and thrive. Let me give you a little example. For many years, one of my best clients in Chicago used to buy brackets, sheet metal brackets, from overseas. And for years and years, they would receive these brackets, they would come in, and they would be sometimes right. Sometimes wrong. Sometimes the holes would be off. Sometimes uh, there'd be drama. It would be plated galvanized. The next time zinc. The next time they'd forget to plate them. Sometimes there would be uh, a shoreman strike at the port. They'd have drama. They didn't want to deal with the drama anymore. So they pivoted to our company because we invested in automation so that we can make tools. But the, number, the numbers tell all. You could tell that the economy's booming. You could tell that uh, the automation's starting to have a positive impact because you could see two things very clearly. One thing is that unemployment is falling and falling and falling, and also manufacturing employment is raising. So in this chart, you could see the um, orange line is the unemployment rate, which is dropping. Oh, and by the way, Manufacturing, which a lot of people in conventional wisdom says is dead, manufacturing jobs are going up. What do I attribute that to? More robots, more automation, because our employees are more productive, they're doing things that are more useful, they're adding more value, and you could bring the jobs back into America. So this is a very exciting time. Matter of fact, this momentum is going so fast, which is delicious, it's a blessing, right? is that we've gotten into a situation where we now have 500,000 open jobs in manufacturing that we can't fill because we, there's not enough people out there. There's an actual shortage of labor, so much so that some projects in America are not getting to go, uh, go as fast as they could, right? Which means that there's going to be more robotics and more automation because we're going to need more tools like that to make our people even more efficient and more effective. Here's a great chart to show what I was describing. So the red number right here is how many unemployed people there are. You can see it's dropping. And the blue number is how many job openings we have. So what's happening is we actually have a situation where we have more job openings than we have people that are looking for a job. This is a wonderful problem. It's a blessing. But this is part of the reason why we need more automation. We need more robotics. And it's critical to the success of our country and manufacturing in America. So recently, a poll was given to presidents of factories and presidents and, and uh, S&P 100 companies, high-level people that are making big decisions. And they asked them, what are your current challenges moving forward? And virtually every one of the top answers dovetailed into a thirst for more robotics, more automation. That train is leaving the station and it's going fast. So, for example, number one answer that's challenging CEOs, 
attracting and retaining a good quality workforce. Well, if you're giving your employees less scut work, less boring work, and you're having the robots deal with that more, that's a more attractive opportunity. If you have the employees doing more high-end things, like running a fancy robot, rather than doing boring things, that's more, it's a more attractive job. You can also pay them better. Number two, health healthcare costs are going up. Well, if you have more robots and more automation, you pay Blue Cross Blue Shield less. Number three, rising raw material costs. Well, rising raw material, if, if you have robots and automation, you need less raw materials. Why? Well, because you have less scrap. Your yield is higher. Robots uh, are more effective and efficient at using materials. So there's a series of reasons why people are migrating to um, uh, the, um, the, the, a lot of um, paradigms are happening simultaneously, kind of accelerating this speed of, uh, of robot adoption, of automation adoption. And we're just on the cusp of this. This is like an industrial revolution for robotics. We're going to look back on this in 20 and 30 years about how this was the pivot point right this moment that we're in right now. We don't, we don't necessarily understand it or see it, but it's really happening this second. I mean, the bottom line here is, how do we save and grow U.S. manufacturing jobs because they're so critical? We recently were featured inside the, uh, the Wall Street Journal a couple weeks ago, last month, asking, how do we do it? What's our method? Well, one of our paradigms that we're changing here at Marlin and at other companies throughout as they adopt more robotics and more automation is we're actually having our employees pivoting from the rote carpal tunnel boring work to writing lines of code, writing software so that they can enhance the machine and make it go faster. And they could uh, uh, reduce the scrap in the raw materials that we talked about before. This is a wonderful time where people are moving away from the brunt, brawn work of past to using more of their brains and more of their uh, mind. I think all of these things will improve our situation with income in inequality. People talk a lot about income inequality, about how there's a huge gap between how many rich people there are and how many poor people there are. My thesis is don't pull down the rich people. Instead, let's take people who are in poverty now and pull them up. That's the right approach. And the best way to do that is with robotics and automation. If we can grow the middle class, not by pulling rich people down, but by pulling poor people up, that'll be a huge win. And I think that's an important thing moving forward, and robotics and automation does that. So let me introduce you to two of my wonderful teammates, Jakina and Jerry. So Jerry's on the left, and Jerry, before I met him, was having challenging times, was late on his home mortgage payment, was going to lose his house, and was going to lose his car. He's happily married with kids. He's not pre pretty. We hired him, and he runs our laser at night. He's coding and uploading information and, and making sure the quality is really good. This is because of robots and automation. If we didn't have that technology, we wouldn't have opportunities for him. Chikino on the right was also in challenging straits. We hired her, and now she's been promoted. She's running, uh, she's running one of our machines on day shift, and now we're going to be sending her to Connecticut to learn how to operate a brand new machine we just bought six weeks ago so she can get even more promotions. So this is the kind of thing that really has an impact in real people's lives, pulling people from poverty into the middle class. When I say middle class, I don't mean like conventional 50 grand a year jobs. I'm talking about really good jobs. What do I mean by that? The average American manufacturing employee is paid over $84,000 a year. That's average, right? Some are higher, some are lower. 84,000, that's real coin. I mean, with that kind of money, you could send a kid to college. You could have a vacation and have a comfortable vacation. These are good jobs. 96% of manufacturing employees in America get health insurance. And we're not talking about a couple jobs. We're talking about 12.8 million jobs in America are manufacturing jobs. We, if we do this right, 
with more automation and more robotics, we can get this up to 25 million. Wouldn't that be a blessing? That's what I'm talking about, pulling people up from poverty and into the middle class. This is a picture here of Maxi. Maxi graduated from college in art. Now, everybody knows the, how everybody's down on art, right? And graduating school from those kinds of classes. Well, she took her art degree, and she learned how to operate a router, which we taught her, big fancy computer with software, and she does all our molds, all of our fixtures, all of our wooden uh, apparatus that basically hold or grip our baskets and our racks and our sheet metal fabrications. She makes the fixtures that hold that with wood, um, wood, um, this wood router, which cuts up the wood precisely, plus or minus two thousandths of an inch. So she used her talent and background and, and her interest in using her hands with art and has deployed it into making uh, routed fixtures for Marlin. It's helped us thrive and, and survive. And, and this is the kind of thing where we're going to be able to help uh, get people into the middle class. And the bottom line is these middle class jobs are jobs with dignity, and these middle class jobs are safe. They're not like jobs from the past. Meet Asia. She's another college graduate from our, our, our local schools. And she uh, right now is in charge of integrating all of our uh, product line into various catalog houses. So I don't know if you've heard of Granger or MSC or Fastenal. These are some of these companies out there that do cat industrial catalogs. We're in all those industrial catalogs. Asia's our point person. She integrates our products right into their uh, catalog line. And of course, she's also in charge of our Amazon account. Amazon's a good client of ours. So we, uh, Asia is our uh, point person, but again, it's not necessarily, it's, it's because we're so good with robotics and automation that it makes viable that Amazon, Granger, McMaster, MSC, Fastenal would all be interested in buying from us consistently. But the bottom line is these jobs are really good jobs, well-paying jobs. You could see uh, some of the dollars that people are paying for some of these jobs in manufacturing over here. And there are a broad variety of industries. Some of them, um, th th these are the average overall compensations right here. Obviously, people that are engineers will get paid more. People uh, that are in the quality department will get paid more. But these are good, well-paying jobs. So I'm an enthusiastic uh, supporter of embracing automation. This is a picture of uh, Edwin. Uh, Edwin is running that punch, that loud punch you just heard a couple minutes ago. Uh, he does all the programming. Neat story about Edwin. Last month, uh, just to scroll back, Edwin is from El Salvador, and he ran away because they're having some very challenging times in El Salvador, came to our country, has uh, a child, uh, two children and, and a wife, and uh, last month, yay, he became an American citizen. We're really supportive of him. And this is the kind of thing, these are the kinds of opportunities that we can grow our companies through uh, using immigrants and uh, locals to fill our jobs. So Edwin, we sent to uh, school in Connecticut uh, for uh, uh, last week, uh, a week ago, to, um, to run the new press break, and we're going to be sending him again for advanced school. Again, well, we could pay him more because he knows so much about automation and integration of these various robots. He's running four different robots simultaneously. Let me give you another uh, example of the benefits of automation and uh, robotics. So when I first bought the company 21 years ago, we're a 51-year-old company, we would make mesh baskets, frequently make mesh baskets, and our employees would have to cut the mesh into squares or rectangles and turn them into the panels on the side of a mesh basket. So our methodology, again, this is before the deployment of technology, before robotics, before automation, we would hand them a scissor, I kid you not, a shear actually, look at, but a manual scissor and a piece of chalk. And they would get on their hands and knees, literally with the chalk, and they would draw straight lines of where the mesh would go. And then, after they would do that, they would take the shear, and then they would cut the steel mesh on their hands and knees on f these five foot by 10 foot sheets. They would do this on concrete. They'd do this for hours. They would do this for days, you know, eight hour day, next day, eight hour. You know, if we had a big job of 1,000 mesh baskets, you would need a over 1,000 panels to make it. They would be on their hands and knees. 
That's hard, it's hard to imagine dignity with that, right? It's, it's backbreaking work. It's on your knees, on concrete floors. So we invested in robotics and technology to improve that, and we bought a laser. This laser is made in Connecticut, but Marlin's not the only company in America that's had this experience. So you can see manufacturing is in orange, but durable goods, the kind of stuff I make, is, is blue. So you can see from the time I graduated college around here, okay, don't think I'm old, I hope. Uh, 19, I graduated in 88, but it, this starts in 87. To this point right here, the average American factory worker is two and a half times more effective, productive, useful, knocks out more parts. Well, at Marlin, it happens to be five and a half times because we've been leaning in so hard. But this is the future. This is what we have to do. And you could see the benefit. You could pay your people more. You could be more, uh, you could be, you're more likely to be a successful exporter. You're more likely to prosper and thrive. Companies that are not doing this investment to robotics and automation are in big trouble. The bottom line is, how do we supercharge our team so they can beat these other foreign countries, so we can survive, so we can prosper? How can we amp them up? So they did a study of what's the, with all the dis, uh, disruptive technologies that you're investing in, or you plan to invest in, where does robotics rank? And again, they asked these high-level manufacturing CEOs, these high-level uh, S&P 100 uh, people, what, where, where do you f see your investment dollars coming? And a big theme was additive manufacturing, which Marlin does, cloud computing, which Marlin does, and also number four was robotics, at 40%. People are 40% of these larger companies are going to be doing leaning heavily into robotics. Let me give you another example of why robotics and automation help the employee and help uh, our, us, Marlin, be more efficient and effective. So when, when I first bought the company, every single weld was done by hand, one at a time. So we would take a basket, and every single basket has intersections, and all these intersections here have to be welded one at a time. So we had little welders, 20,000 watt, 25,000 watt welders that are about this big, and I'll show you a picture of them in a little bit. And the employee would take his foot, take the basket, and they would weld, and the, and the copper would come down and touch the two intersections here, and, and 20,000 watts would go through there and, make the, and join it, basically, with this heat and the pressure, one at a time every weld, one at a time. And you have to look down on your work, and you work looking, so all day long, eight hours a day, you tell me, is this fun? Eight hours a day. Is this good for your back, you know, how, what, is your, what does your chiropractor say about that plan, right? Not too pretty, boring. Also the employee may miss some, right? So heavy investment in robotics, heavy investment in automation, what do I mean by that? Well, we, we invested in a machine, there's five of these in the world, four in Germany. We have the fifth one. So rather than welding the X and Y axis manually, every single intersection, that's the bottom welds, right? That's an X and Y axis. And the Z axis, that's the side weld welds. We are now welding in a whole different way. So you can see how we weld at Marlin now. So our employees are not leaning over like this welding, right? 20,000 watts, now you're seeing 250,000 watts. So to keep this in perspective, when you turn off the light plant to go to sleep, that's 60 watts. This is 250,000 watts. That's how much fire is going through. And it's going through there in less than two thousandths of a second. By the way, this, you see that wood part right there? That was Maxie's handiwork. You guys met Maxie, okay? She did the wood, she made the wood mold, the fixture we talked about before. Well, you could see her wood mold work right here. She was the one that made that fixture. So that's how this all ties together. So Maxi uh, puts that in, and you met Malcolm before. Malcolm loads the wires in there, and then the robot does that. So in the past, we'd have people doing one at a time, back-breaking, carpal tunnel, really boring. Now we've elevated them, and now we export these baskets to 40 countries. And we can uh, um, bid at a much better, more rational price so we can win more jobs because our employees are so much more effective and productive. 
So back to that study we talked about a couple minutes ago. They asked other questions. Another question was, what is your motivation for investing in disruptive technologies? And the first four answers, drive efficiencies in the production process. You tell me, if you're going to cut mesh on your hands and knees, is it faster to do it that way or on a laser, right? Number two, increase the quality. When you've got a piece of chalk and a hand shear, how are you going to touch the laser at four thousandths of an inch? Number three, differentiate your product or your service offerings. If you could have extraordinary quality because of the automation and the investment in technology, you're building a nice moat. And then number four is speed. So these are the four top reasons. All of these dovetail perfectly with why robotics and automation will bring more to the table. Let me give you another example. When we first bought the company, if we were going to weld something, the person would use an arc welder or a MIG welder to weld the intersection. Each weld was done by hand, one at a time, and if we had a job with 12 welds on, on a basket times 1,000 basket, it would be 12,000 manual welds. Sparks flying, really nasty stuff. Fast forward, we've invested in technology made in, Chicago, uh, made in Cleveland, uh, and, and uh, Lincoln is the name of the company, and it's married to a Japanese robot called Fanuc right here. Fanuc, by the way, is a sponsor, so I just want to give them a shout out. Uh, anyway, but uh, this cell is made in Cleveland. Uh, we got it in January of last year. It's our newest uh, MIG welding robotic cell. And what it does is it welds all the intersections. So you can see uh, every single intersection used to be welded with a human, and now we're using robotics to hit all those intersections. It doesn't forget any intersection. It gets every one the right amount. And it's, again, it empowers us so that we can ship all over the world. It's also got an arm that can move to different uh, sides and different uh, areas of the, um, uh, of the basket. Another nice feature of it is that it's choreographed. This is a different project. This is a food processing project. So here, uh, the basket is being welded, and it stays in the fixture and they act uh, in a choreographed fashion. The base is gonna pivot, you're gonna see this in a second, and it's gonna, it's like a ballet, it's like a choreographed ballet. And the beauty of that, it just happened, is that the basket stays inside the fixture so it does not uh, have to be removed out. The benefit of that is you don't have accretive tolerance problems, so you have higher quality and you have less uh, chance of uh, a problem where the basket is uh, misaligned. The next thing that's pretty cool about this is that we're including uh, it's, um, a laser here where in a couple seconds it's going to be taking a look and watching where uh, the weld is occurring. You can see it doing it right there where it's eyeing it up, double checking everything's peachy. So the benefit of that is it's more likely to self-correct if it's a little bit off. So this is the kind of technology uh, that's, being that's being embraced by American manufacturing, and, and I think it's going to power the world and improve our productivity. Bottom line is we need, as a country, to incre increase the amount of automation and robotics, not just uh, for, for the company's well-being, but of course for the employee's well-being. This is a, a, a picture of James. James is on the front page of the New York Times a couple years back. James uh, grew up on the wrong side of the tracks in Baltimore. Uh, Baltimore is uh, our town, the town I'm from, and uh, didn't get any fair shakes in life. Uh, and um, to make ends meet in the very beginning, uh, he worked uh, on a street corner selling drugs and uh, got caught, did his time, came out and got a job at Popeye's doing fast food. It's honorable, it's, it, he's getting paid, he's doing a, 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 making a, a living. It was uh, honest work. However, he wanted to make more money. So he migrated to manufacturing and now he makes four times more, five times more rather, of what he made when he worked at Popeye's and he's running $2 million worth of technology, and his parts are shipping all over the world. The best part of this story is he sent his daughter off to college, and she just recently graduated. How cool is that? 
We're really proud of James. It's neat. That's what it's all about. We've got to pull people up from poverty, and this is what it's all about. So let me scroll back a little bit. So I bought the company 21 years ago, but there was, the company was operating for 30 years before me, and we were established in 1968, and we made bagel baskets. So when you go to a bagel shop like Einstein or Brubaker's or Manhattan Bagel, you would go and see little wire baskets where people would buy, the, they would display the various bagels. And this is what our factory looked like the day I bought the company. We took some pictures. And if you look carefully, you could see right over here, it says, be careful. Boy, I should have looked at that sign more carefully. I made a big boo-boo. Anyway, at the time, uh, I thought this was going to be a great thing because the company was making money. But it was 3,000 square feet, tiny factory in Brooklyn, uh, and uh, it was very antiquated. The newest piece of equipment was from the 50s. Um, you could see uh, um, all the machines uh, that we had there. It was very antiquated. It, it, was, like a, it was like straight out of uh, a Darwin, Charles, uh, a, a Dickens movie. Um, we literally had two employees that were missing eyes. And this is one of my favorite pictures from that first day when we took, the, when we took pictures. The employee is standing next to a sign that says, safety first, wear goggles. And you can see he's not wearing... Any, any safety features. So we literally had two people. That was the first thing I did. I said, you must wear goggles if you're going to work at Marlin. The job was very hazardous. We had two employees who were missing fingers. They were um, accidents that occurred. Remember that wel that, those welders I told you about? The accidents occurred because they were putting... The, these are the welders right here. You can see number five and number two. They put their hands inside where the electrode touches right there. And it was literally like a guillotine, OK? So by putting people outside the cages, out, you know, not near where the dangerous stuff happens, you're going to protect your employees. And it's going to be a more exciting work environment. But at that time, that's, that's the level of, of the company we bought. So we had the employees had no health insurance. Their health insurance plan is you go to the emergency room. Um, you could see uh, how they bent uh, the wire. This is one of the employees bending wire. You could see him picking up the wire, and he's putting it down on this little bending table right over here. And that little mandrel is how he's going to bend the wire one at a time. So when you make a bagel basket, the top of frame has four bends. All four of those bends were done by hand. Okay, The employees would take, would, the truck would come with wire, was cut to size, and they would load them on their shoulders carry them in, because we didn't have a forklift truck heavy enough to carry it, and the employees would carry the wire, drop it on the ground, hopefully nobody's foot was there when they dropped it. They would pick it up one at a time, and you could see how that employee would then hand bend each piece one at a time. Uh, there was no uh, retirement plan. Social Security was our retirement plan. And if, and if a client wanted to reorder a part, We'd say, yeah, sure, send us back the basket so we could copy it since we had no prints. We had no technology. Uh, in some cases, we were lucky. We would have an old sample that we made for the client on the wall, and we'd have to remember which job it was and pull it off the wall. That's what it looked like. So that's the company I bought. It worked. For 30 years, that worked. So I bought it, and I thought, well, for another 30 years, we're just going to keep on doing that. If it ain't broke, don't fix it, right? We're going to keep on selling bagel baskets, and this is going to go great. And if they could do this with this terrible technology and no safety, can you imagine what we could do with some, you know, modern thought, 1998 thought? Everything was going peachy the instant I bought it. The company is actually doing very well. Why? Well, because I don't know if you remember back then, there was a bagel basket, bagel fat and it became very commonplace throughout America to eat bagels. It became vogue. People used to eat them for breakfast like crazy. And uh, it wasn't just Jewish people, it was many Christian people embraced it. And they started opening up these bagel shops all over the place. And rather than having you know, one bagel shop in Reno, Nevada, you might have five. And, and rather than two in Akron, you'd need 10. Well, this is brilliant if you're the biggest bagel ma basket manufacturer in America. Well, all of a sudden, something terrible happened. Of course, right after I bought it. Didn't see this one coming. We had foreign imports. Foreign imports started deluging 
the market and were killing me. So let me give you like how it worked math-wise. I would sell to Einstein Bagels 1,000 bagel baskets for 12 bucks a throw, $12,000 order. That's how I made a living. Let me break it down a little bit more. We'd pay $7 for the steel, and we'd have $5 to cover everything else. That's the Christmas party, the health insurance, rent, chrome plating, and of course paying for the welder, right? And paying for new safety glasses, things like that. So that's, and we made a little bit of profit off that $5. That was our business model, and I thought that was gonna be the business model for the next 30 years. Well, I was wrong, because all of a sudden, we started receiving imports from foreign countries for $6 a throw delivered into Manhattan. Remember, my steel cost seven. So, I mean, we were underwater instantly. The world stopped. We're bleeding, hemorrhaging, dying, very bad. It couldn't get worse, because all my clients were like, this is madness, I'm gonna buy the $6 basket, I'm not gonna buy the $12 basket. I thought it couldn't get worse. It actually got worse. Because next, there was a new fad. It was called the Atkins diet. I don't know if you know, remember the Atkins diet. The Atkins diet is whatever you do, never, ever, ever eat a carbohydrate. Ever. Got a problem. If you are selling bagel baskets, and a bagel, by the way, is the world's biggest carbohydrate, right? You're in deep doo-doo. And that's what happened to Marlon. So we got hit not with just foreign imports, selling below cost of steel, right? We also got hit by Atkins diet. We were dying. It was killing us. And we had to pivot. The problem is nobody sends you an email in 1998, 1999, 2000 to say, by the way, this is how you get the heck out of this problem. We didn't have any clues. We were just dying. So really our choice was we were either going to transform or we were going to become extinct. It was not exactly clear which way we were going to go. And I was killing myself trying to figure out what would be the pivot? What would be the transformation? What is the market that we were going to go to that would save the company? So around this time, I got a fortuitous phone call from an engineer at Boeing. And he said to me, I need a custom basket about this big, about this wide. I need a handful of them. What's the price? I said to him, Jeez, it's just 25 baskets. I'm going to have to charge you 24 bucks. And he goes, yeah, yeah, whatever. Ding, that was the light. Because all of a sudden, I had a market that I should focus on and I should pursue. What is that market? Well, that market is the, Boeing needed something custom or engineered. They needed something high quality, because they're Boeing. And they needed it quick. They couldn't wait six weeks for a boat from, from overseas. So I realized that is our future. Quality, engineering, quick. So much so that I literally trademarked it with the copyright office. And that is our focus, that is our mantra, that is what we are going to be moving forward on from now on. And that's why robotics and automation dovetail so well into our mantra of quality engineering quick. So now we cater to a completely different clientele. We don't cater to the bagel basket market anymore. That market's dead to us. We can't work there, we can't live there. There's nothing, there's no oxygen there. Instead, we've pivoted to people that appreciate quality, appreciate engineering, appreciate quick shipment. We like to sell to S&P 100 companies. This is a, a picture from last month from GE Healthcare, engineers from GE Healthcare opening up a box with our baskets inside. They couldn't be more thrilled with get, receiving our products. This is the kind of clients we want to sell to, not people that are comparing my price of 12 bucks for a bagel basket versus six, a subsidized steel price, a subsidized labor price from overseas. Now we're pivoting not just to medical, but we're also pivoting to automotive. These are baskets that are used to hold Ford F-150 parts. So we're not making Ford F-150s, the, the big pickup truck, we're making the baskets that hold the Ford F-150s. So you can see how we collaborate. Our laser and our punch makes these parts. We also make Baskets for food processing. That's another market that appreciates high quality, no sharps, highly engineered. We also make baskets for military as well. And this is, uh, again, we don't make military components, we make baskets that hold military parts. So the bottom line is we have to focus on excellent quality. And it's because of robotics, because of automation, because I have a dream team, 
at our company that are so focused on quality. We've done a great job of improving our quality over the years. And most recently, we're at 99.7% in quality last quarter. And uh, what that means in English is if we shipped 1,000 baskets, all of them were good. If one is bad, we consider all lot of 1,000 bad because the client had to pick up the phone and complain and talk to us, right? So, we, so we're tough graders on ourselves. Despite that, we had a 99.7. A lot of the reason why we're having the benefit is because of the heavy embrace of automation and uh, robotics. We also use a lot of uh, amazing, talented engineers. Um, and 18% uh, uh, of our employees are degreed mechanical engineers. Uh, I'm blessed with great people. And again, we talked about speed. So uh, uh, how do we go faster? Well, back in Brooklyn, they were bending 300 hand bends an hour. Now we have robots. You saw James running a robot, and they're running 5,000 bends an hour, OK? And James hasn't moved his, his arm muscle. So our company now is at a new place where because the robotics and the automation is so precise, we can unleash our engineers and let them think outside the box and push edges and envelopes they never touched before. They couldn't. Why? Because things were not so precise. And now they can touch new worlds. So for example, we've gone out and we've gotten all kinds of patents. So for example, uh, patents for aerospace, patents for automotive, patents for working with robots, patents for medical, patents uh, for, for material handling devices. Let me give you an example. So this is one uh, of our um, uh, new patents that we just got, patent pending. And uh, this is a, a basket that was made on that laser I showed you earlier today. And it holds General Motors uh, Silverado components. So General Motors, uh, uh, one of their suppliers, puts um, our, their components in here. And this basket works with other robots. So a big challenge for robot integration is that the robots are very picky. If, if, if the part is not exactly where it's supposed to be, the robot will crash. And to make real money, you got to have that factory running 365 days a year, 24 hours a day, never having the robot stop, never crashing. Well, if you have the baskets or the material handling racks a little bit off, it causes a big, big problem. Why? Because the robot will crash. You need your fancy foreman to walk over, reset up the machine. Could be an hour, could be two hours for him to reset it. You may need new fixtures for the gripping. So we've developed a basket that's very tight tolerance. Because it's so tight tolerance, the robots don't crash. Because the robots don't crash, they can run for days and days without stopping. So this is the kind of thing that our engineers could never have done unless they had the robotics, the automation, and, and um, the kind of tight tolerances that a laser provides. This is another example of a different, uh, this is a basket we exported to Canada holding Canadian parts. And you can see how, how consistent uh, the, the parts are. And that, that's the kind of thing that makes us different. My favorite, one of my uh, inspirational figures is Steve Jobs. And he had a famous line, start with the customer experience, work backwards to the technology. So in this case, I realized, we realized that factories needed to run their lines unimpeded, nonstop, never stop. And we developed a basket with our technology and automation that could enhance the client's experience. Let me give you another example. Aerospace. So every single airplane has big jet engines. Inside the jet engine are these very tight tolerance, expensive veins and blades. They periodically have to be removed from a jet and inspected. If there's like a ding in it or a mark or a fracture or a stress crack, it could be disastrous for the passengers and the pilots. So they got to go through it very carefully. The aerospace industry, the aviation industry, has done a remarkable job of upping their game and improving their quality. So we work closely with aerospace because they appreciate quality and they appreciate technology and, and, and helping them. What we do is we make the baskets that hold the blades so that there's no metal on metal contact. Well, in walking through their factories, we realized that in many cases they will put the big quarter million dollar Pratt Whitney GE um, 
Rolls-Royce engines on the ground, literally on the ground, or they'll put it on wood pallets that could mar the surface. So for example, like an engine cowl, that, that's the, the part that goes on the side of uh, an airplane engine, they'll lay it on the ground. When, by laying it on the ground, it might ding or mar the finish. It might scratch it. It might uh, uh, change the tolerances so it's not functional. Well, what happens is they have to reject it and inspect it again, and then they have to rework it. They might have to machine it. They may have to replate it, and then they have to let it sit quarantine for six months to see if a new stress fracture comes out. This is a disaster for an airline because they want to get that airplane up. So in many cases, you'll see airplane engines floating around factories with wood pallets. Wood pallets, $4.50 wood pallets. So we uh, told them, hey, by the way, you could have a nail sticking up in that wood pallet. It'll destroy the, the engine or it could screw it up so that you have to rework it. And then you're going to have the $200 million airplane sitting on the tarmac, and you're going to have 250 clients really ticked off because their plane's not going to ship on time, get, leave uh, O'Hare or whatever on time. So we came up with an idea, and again, new patent, to make what's called circular floats. And these circular floats float through the factory, carrying their parts like jet engines so that there's no metal-on-metal -metal contact. There's no nails sticking up. We couldn't have done this unless we had the robots. We couldn't have done this unless we had the technology. We couldn't have done this unless we had the automation. But because we have that, we could differentiate ourselves. This is no bagel basket. This is carrying a quarter million dollar or three quarter million dollar Rolls Royce engine that's going to be going on a $200 million plane. It's not a 50 cent bagel where the client that I used to sell to, their tolerance was plus or minus a bagel. Right? If the bagel didn't fall out, that was a quality success. Right? If the bagel falls out, that's a quality failure. That was the level of client I was dealing with in the past. Now I'm dealing with people that have three-quarter million dollar Rolls-Royce engines. We have expanded metal base so that metal shavings or fasteners or dirt debris can exit out the bottom and not mar the finish. The blue stuff is truck bed liner, and that's what makes sure there's no metal and metal contact. We put neoprene on the top lid so if they have a, an alignment problem and they put it rested on the side, it won't scratch and mar the finish. So we sell a lot of these and this is good for our factory and we've developed a number of different tools and techniques to help the aerospace industry be more effective, more efficient. Again, without robots, without automation, we could never have done it. With, you know, one hand bending, 300 hand bends an hour, we'd never have gotten there because we couldn't hold the tolerance, we couldn't make the quality. We also make devices for um, uh, health care. Uh, this is for um, people that lose their hair during chemotherapy. We also have uh, design patents uh, for holding cylinders so that when you're doing material handling of cylinders uh, through a factory, it'll hold them just right, consistently, and lightweight. We also have design patents. We talked about this basket before. This is called an expanded metal basket. We have a design patent on this. We added a sheet metal band right here because in the past, this sheet, when you cut this expanded metal here, it leaves a sharp edge. So employees, if they touch that intersection, it'll cut them, right? It'll be bad for the employee. So we added that, and we have a design patent on that, and that's helping employees. So the bottom line is, in the past, the conventional wisdom was, America, you're toast. Manufacturing in America, you're through. You're the dodo bird. You can't compete with foreign imports because of it's so, the wages are so much higher. The EPA ref, you know, refuses you to allow your effluent into the Chesapeake Bay, which is a good thing, and they allow it, and you know, you, you're allowed to dump it into the Yangtze, but you can't do it in the Chesapeake Bay. The benefits for our employees, the uh, OSHA, the protection of, uh, of our employees, the conventional wisdom said it didn't work, but now, it can with automation and robotics. And I believe it's, it's, we're at a wonderful time. We're at an inflection point where good things can happen. This is a, a little, uh, um, a little uh, video so you can see the difference in the speed between 300 hand bends an hour and 5,000 bend, 5, bends done by a robot. It's just a different world now. And, and that's our future and that's how we're gonna survive. So the bottom line is guys like James, when I bought the company, would get paid minimum wage, they would hand bend all day, 
They'd have 300 hand bends an hour. That was their expectation. Eight hours a day, five days a week. Oh, by the way, next week you're doing the same dang thing. Their arms were like Popeye, okay? One arm would be normal size. The other arm would be like Popeye because every day they were bending, bending over and over again. They would have problems with carpal tunnel syndrome. Their jobs were incredibly boring, incredibly repetitive, and it was just not a pleasant life. So now we use robots again to form the wire so that they're not doing the boring stuff. In the past, they would have to work through the pain. In the past, they would go home and they would ice down their shoulder and their arm so they wouldn't feel so bad. That stuff don't happen anymore because robots are doing the nasty stuff, the repetitive stuff, the carpal tunnel stuff. Now we're using their brain and they're not doing scut work. So the point is that we can have employees not doing each one of those bends. And you can see how it's doing the bends and the weld too. In the past they wouldn't. So we can now grow careers and we could be, uh, approach people differently, focus on training, and now we can harness technology so the employees are superhumans. And they're not, it's not like the old days. They can be hyperproductive. This is a picture of Brent. Brent did two tours over in Afghanistan and Iraq protecting you and me. And Brent uh, um, is in charge of programming that robot that does MIG welding and TIG welding that we export parts all over the world. And he's been to Cleveland for training three times, each time for a week, to learn how to operate that machine and get it going higher and higher. He owns a home, him and his spouse own a car. This is what the middle class life is what we're talking about. So he came back from Iraq and Afghanistan, and we got him a middle class job. And, and that's what we're trying to accomplish. And the goal here is that guys like Nathan, you can see Nathan over here, the black hat, he's working outside the cage, and all of the scary stuff, the robotics, the, the, the scut work stuff is done, the carpal tunnel stuff is done inside the cage. And it's having a positive impact on safety. We've gone over 3,000 days without a safety incident, and more recently, uh, 500 days. 3,000 was our record, 500 is our most recent. And that's because the robots are doing the nasty stuff. Matter of fact, we've been acknowledged by uh, OSHA, which focuses on the well-being of all of our employees. They um, uh, are so comfortable with our process, our rigor, and our procedures that they've given us the distinction called SHARP. And what that means is, is that every company in America can be inspected 24 hours a day, seven days a week, to make sure that the employees are being well treated. A very small percentage of companies, in my state, five, I'm in Maryland, five companies are exempt from surprise inspections because we have this sharp certificate, because they have so much comfort in how we treat and respect our employees and how focused we are on safety. I attribute a lot of that not only to our procedures, but also the heavy emphasis on robotics and automation and making sure that uh, the employees are never in harm's way. Uh, by the way, you can see this is the governor of Maryland right here. Uh, in this next slide, two years later, we were re-upped, again got another sharp award, and this here, the gentleman in the white tie, I'm sorry, the white shirt, blue tie, that gentleman right there is uh, the Secretary of Labor uh, in the President's Cabinet and he came to our factory to give us that award. So the bottom line is we're growing. First four months of this year, best four months in company history, 51 year company history, first four months of the year, biggest profits we've ever had. We're now hiring uh, a mechanic, a, a fixture maker, um, and uh, two engineers, a chemical engineer and a mechanical engineer. They all start this month. Bottom line is how do we prosper in America? How do we pull people up? You need more embrace of robotics and automation. It'll improve the worker safety profile. It'll allow your engineers to have cutting edge designs. It'll allow you to have intellectual property so you can create amazing moats. And then that will lead to your prosperity. I really appreciate you coming today, spending some time with me. We do have time for some questions. We have a microphone over there. Uh, thank you so much for joining us and I'd be happy to answer any questions you have.